You might think it's odd to discuss this week in Jihad. The infidels don't know the motive. But David Wood's here, and he's got it all clear. He's more powerful than a locomotive. Ladies and gentlemen, this week in Jihad is back and better than ever. I am Robert Spencer, author of the Quran, and with us tonight, as always, is the world's premier foe of cant, hypocrisy, deception, and lies, Dr. David Wood. David, welcome. You know, uh, you know at the uh, rate you're using up rhymes there, you're going to run out. Run out? Yeah, you're going gonna to be like, it's going to be like 25 weeks from now, and you're going to be like, <laughs> you're going to be like, uh, down with jihadis, let's all do Pilates. And, That's uh, great. That's great. I'll go with that next week. Anyway, lots of jihad this week, ladies and gentlemen, but I think we should start with a friend, your friend and mine, Uthman ibn Farouk. Oh. There he is, stabbed in San Diego by a ranting Islamophobe, but it appears in an expose published this week that Uthman ibn Farouk was not entirely on the level. David, what do you think? What what exactly happened here? Shocker, shock. You know, you know, you know. It's funny, Robert. I was just on, a, and anyone who saw it can verify. I was just on a live stream a few days ago <clears throat> with Dr. Tony Costa, and people were, you know, asking about various things and so on. And I said, uh, in, in a dis during a discussion with Sheikh Uthman came up um, that if you want, if you're dealing with a narcissist, how you deal with a narcissist is. You give the narcissist a ton of attention. So give the narcissist a attention for a couple months and then completely ignore the narcissist and watch what happens as he tries to uh, regain the attention. He'll do some crazy, really stupid stuff. And then, of course, we have uh, this story that that you just uh, uh, that you're referencing where came out that Sheikh Uthman, after uh, claiming that he was stabbed and then claiming that um, he fought, filed a police report and that the, the perpetrator had been arrested and alhamdulillah, it turns out uh, the San Diego Police Department said, we have no record of any of this ever. Nothing, no police report, no one being arrested. They have no idea what's going on here. Uh, it's Sheikh Uthman saying it. And, th and that's why Sheikh Uthman's getting all sorts of nicknames. They, they call him Sheikh Ibn Fibbin, um, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Ibn Footnote because <laughs> he uh, tried to use a footnote as a Muslim source at one point. Um, Sheikh Ibn Smollett, uh, after Jesse Smollett. Uh, so, yeah, he's getting some some great names. Sheikh, Sheikh Ibn Ketchup from the Ketchup from the picture that he was using. And so, uh, yep, that's uh, that's our good friend. <laughs> you, guys, if you if you want to become a popular Dai nowadays, just follow the roadmap. And, and Sheikh Uthman has given it to you. Because guess what? His followers do not care. He could yeah. fake a hundred. He could fake a hundred hate crimes. It it doesn't affect him the way it would affect someone like uh, Jesse Smollett. So it's it's like worse. The Ummah is even worse <laughs> when correcting their lying leaders than Hollywood is. This is uh, there are a number of implications to this. This is very interesting case because of course it shows the currency of today of the culture today is victimhood that you, the more you're victimized, the more powerful and influential you are. And so uh, Sheikh Uthman ibn Farouk wanted to be a star, wanted to be powerful, and he knew that the way to do that was not to be compelling or interesting or funny. The way to do that was to be a victim. But the uh, San Diego police keep a publicly accessible database of hate crimes. This is not in it. He never reported anything. So at very least, even if something happened, he lied about how it was being investigated and that the attacker had been arrested. But it's pretty clear that he faked the whole thing and never called the police because there was no crime to report. War yeah, is I, deceit. I think, yeah, and even, even back then, see, I, I didn't call into question that there was some sort of fight, some, but it looked like it was... It was some road rage incident, and he got into a fight with someone. But then he wanted to spin it. Um, the the 
The picture of the blood um, I regarded as obviously fake. Um, Let's see the I've, blood again. The blood is on the screen, David. Yeah, I've, we've actually we've actually like like zoomed in on it and so on. And you can see things like uh, blood spatters and so on, which isn't going to happen if blood is leaking from out of, from you know from inside your body to the outside. Blood spatters what happens if you know blood is splattered on you from outside and so on. Um, but I, I've seen lots of real blood in my life i've been in, been in plenty of fights and so on uh, been covered in blood but had my clothes soaked in blood um and i've dealt with making videos over the years tons of fake blood and the fake blood that he's using there in the picture isn't even good fake blood it's the kind you get it like like for halloween or something like that if you want you know <laughs> you want to be a zombie and want blood leaking down your face or something like that uh, it's not even good fake blood um so yeah I mean, i'm guessing fight road rage and then ooh, i just got an idea hey guys bring me some fake blood so we can turn this into an islamophobic hate crime and of course then after claiming it after claiming it, it, it this is the, this is the problem when when you have a community that constantly agrees with you even if you're lying like even if you're demonstrably indisputably lying it just psychologically impacts you that i can say and do whatever i want and i will never be held to account and so that's what we're seeing right now is hey i can i can do all of this and it could be easy to refute i'll say things that can easily be investigated i'll post a picture that is obviously got fake blood in it um and so that anyone can call up the uh, the San Diego Police Department and and verify that this is all fake. I will do all of that because I know for a fact my followers will never hold me to account. They will always believe me. And even if even if even if it came down to it and the entire police department were in front of me saying that I'm a liar, my fans would believe me, not the police department. They would say it's a it's a conspiracy, probably by the Jews. <laughs> and uh, that's that's just the world we live in. And uh, guys, they won't I believe us say, either. Yeah. And so so it, it, now keep in mind, it's easy to look at this and go, oh, this is this is so bad. It's so bad that these are the guys who are leading the UMA. No, guys, I'll say it. I've said it a thousand times. I'll say it a thousand more. It's great that these are that these are the guys who are emerging as the leaders. The, these guys who are uh, compulsive liars, complete narcissists. These are the guys who, whether it be two years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, um, they are such narcissists that they start once they start going up against each other and disagreeing and condemning, condemning each other and, and labeling each other uh, kafirs and so on. They're going to destroy it from within. I really believe right now we could stop everything we're doing, Robert, and watch this implode. We could just sit back and watch it implode. But the, we're not. We're going to we're going to continue and expose it because we're going to hasten the demise. In the on on the Caribbean island, while we're sipping pina coladas. If you like pina coladas, <laughs> join me and Robert. <laughs> uh, no more jihad. That's it. All right, uh, let's uh, deal with Iran, David. A lot of things happening in Iran. Got a few stories here. Of course, uh, one notable story that went around the world is of Elnaz Rekabi, the uh, Olympic uh, or some kind of champion mountain climber. Uh, I didn't know that they did that. You know, that was pretty cool video of her climbing up walls. And uh, they've got a special wall that's got sort of mountain features. But anyway, uh, she competed without a hijab. She went back to Iran, apparently was arrested. She has now said that she uh, did it inadvertently, that the hijab fell off and she didn't notice, but there are no photographs of her wearing it at this particular meet. And so it does seem as if she was trying to make a protest, but was rather taken aback by the reaction. These uh, Iranian authorities, of course, are operating on the basis of the Quran's directives, such as chapter 8, verse 60, strike terror in the enemies of Allah. And so to terrorize this uh, individual, clearly they have threatened her to say that it was an accident and she's not really protesting at all. What, what, wouldn't you think that 
that's someone who who should have been given immediate asylum. Oh yeah, no doubt about it. But of course, uh, you know it's very problematic because the European Union is doing business with the Islamic Republic. The Biden administration was trying very hard to revive the Iran deal. They don't want to see the regime fall. They want to do business with the regime. So they're not going to be helping the protesters. The protesters are on their own. I uh, wish them all success. There was one story here that gives great hope. uh, And that was that the security forces actually fled from the protesters, reportedly, in several cities. And that is really the only way this thing can can succeed if the security forces get tired of shooting down their own friends, wives, daughters, etc., and that they become afraid of them. Yep, and that's uh, that's that's how I mean, you know, it, it it sucks to see fighting and all the people who die and so on, but. That's how revolutions work, right? You know, people want, people get sick of being oppressed by their by their oppressors. Um, looks like that's what that's what we got to do. And so, I mean, exactly. we've, we've seen tons of these stories. Um, I mean, it's just amazing that a lot of this. Uh, there are lots of men involved and lots of men who are oh, yeah. um, jumping on, who are uh, you know opposing the Sharia police and so on. But it, it's it's amazing because it's it's women who are really and girls and schoolgirls who are who are leading this revolution and uh, i saw a clip i have to go back and make sure i didn't misinterpret it misinterpret it but it was a uh, because I, I i'm i'm interested in seeing what the various muslim leaders are saying and so you know yasser Qadi uh is uh, he, we've talked about him before and so on but uh i believe this past this past sunday at speaker's corner i it was ali dawa and I think it sounded again. I want to rewatch this, but he was challenging the critics there, saying, "Show me where in the Muslim sources it says that you kill a girl for not wearing hijab properly. Show me that. I'll give you a thousand whatever money they use over there." But um, <laughs> notice this is the same Ali Dawa, the exact same Ali Dawa. So I might have to make a video about this. This is the same Ali Dawa who says that the apostate prophet would be executed in a Muslim country for causing corruption in the land and spreading it. Now think about this. So he, so Ali Dawa is taking Surah Fatiha. You got all these commands to kill apostates in the Muslim sources, but his go-to passage was Surah 5, verse 33 of the Quran, which says that you can kill, crucify, dismember people for the vague crime of causing corruption in the land. So so his reasoning was apostate prophet, by spreading unbelief, would be spreading corruption in the land, in a Muslim land, and therefore he'd be executed. How would you not also apply this to tearing off the hijab. Robert, you studied Islam for years. Uh, not according to me, not according to you. From an Islamic perspective, would girls and women tearing off their hijabs, burning their hijabs, would, would that would that be spreading corruption a court from an Islamic perspective? Without any doubt, David, because they are becoming an occasion of temptation for the men who might see them walking around with their heads uncovered. And it's their responsibility to prevent that temptation. And so it's precisely and specifically corruption that they are causing in the land by walking around uncovered. And uh, causing corruption in the land is actually a specific crime in the penal code of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Yeah, I've, I've seen, uh, I've seen a, a, a pastor charged with that. Mm-hmm. Um, he was charged with spreading corruption in the land. So it's just amazing that a guy... Who, apply, who would apply the death penalty for the apostate prophet for spreading the corruption in the land is the one saying he doesn't see in the Muslim sources where you would where you would kill a girl or a woman for causing corruption in the land. And it's just uh, it's interesting stuff. But anyway, Ali Dawa, uh, when this gets back to you, um, I'll expect my check in the mail. Oh, wait, I'm not giving you my address because we know what had <laughs> happened to me. <laughs> I expect that Ali Dawa knows full well that it's a capital crime in the Islamic Republic and that that's based on Islamic sources. But he wants to try to do what he can to 
make sure that the infidels don't know and keep them wrong-footed on the defensive and feeling as if they are speaking about Islam without knowledge in Britain and consequently should be quiet or perhaps learn from the likes of Ali Dawa and Muhammad Hijab. And so that's what his game is. I would bet he, he can contradict me should he wish. Uh, but in any case, stories out of Iran, um, sexual assaults by police, sometimes in public, of women. Now, David, what, what do you think that's happening for? Yeah, and that's, uh, I think Ali Dawa also uh, challenged on, it was challenging him on that. But, I mean, it sounds like they're just reading Surah 33 of the Quran, which is, you wear the hijab so that you won't be molested. And so, so that if you're not wearing it, yes. That sounds like the implication that if you're if you're not wearing it, it's because you want to be molested. That's it. There's also another thing, and that is that because it's the woman's responsibility to make sure that men aren't tempted, it's her fault if they are. And so in prison, sometimes women in the in Iran have been raped because they're about to be executed. And this makes sure they go to hell in this perspective. Because it's not like they're the victim of the rape. The rape is a, is a mark on their record that Allah will not forgive. And it's just amazing that you have, you know, Muslim Dawagandists and so on saying, where are you getting this from the Muslim sources? I mean, I could think of like 35 different justifications from an Islamic perspective for the stuff that's going on. If you're talking about um, sexually assaulting these women and girls, Notice uh, Allah says, Surah 4, verse 65, that if you do not submit to all of Muhammad's decisions, you're not a real believer. So let me get this straight. These girls are born in Muslim families. They're raised as Muslims. Um, if they start saying, hey, I don't have to wear the hijab. I don't have to follow this stuff. Great. You're not following the commands of Muhammad and the Quran. And therefore, you are not a true believer. It's very easy to label you an apostate. And Robert... If you capture a non-Muslim woman or girl, last time I checked, you can rape them all you want, according to Islam. That's right in the Quran. The captives of the right hand. Such a mystery, such a mystery. All this stuff, it's so mysterious. How It's, it's just amazing because long before ISIS or anything else, we're sitting there explaining what would happen if anyone ever took these Muslim sources seriously in, in parts of the world. And then ISIS comes about, and I was getting messages like, David, I, I saw this I saw this stuff, you know, in this video you said five years ago, and it's like exactly what ISIS is doing and so on. And it's just amazing that it's for for politicians and journalists and educators, everyone is how is how is Iran coming to these conclusions? How are the Sharia police coming to these conclusions? How is the Ayatollah get where is he getting this from? Where's ISIS getting this? And it's like we've been shouting for years, pointing to the Muslim sources exactly where they're getting all of this. And for some reason to this day, we don't know where anyone's getting any of this. It's one of life's great mysteries. David, I think that's an excellent segue to our stupid infidel section for the week. Quite a lot of stupid infidels. Let's go to Germany. And in Germany... It's always Germany, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Here's a story this... from Der Spiegel. Und in Der Spiegel, it says that uh, two people were killed and another seriously injured in a knife attack in Ludwigshafen. Und in Ludwigshafen, the alleged perpetrator was shot und seriously injured by the emergency services while fleeing. Now, he was attacking people with a knife. Now, get this, David. As Spiegel learned from security circles, the alleged perpetrator is said to be a 25-year-old Somali citizen. The man shouted... What do you think he shouted? Oh, gosh. You know what, Robert? I keep getting these right, and I keep wondering why I'm so right. Um, and I think, uh, well, maybe it's because, you know, I'm a genius and so on. And so trying to think of a way to really, you know maybe get the, the wrong answer and so on. So I actually made a, 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 a random, randomized wheel here. Right? And so we can make this truly random where I can't use my brilliant intellect to get this right. So I'm just, I'm going to go with whatever the wheel says. Totally okay. random, totally okay. random. Ready? All right. Uh, it says I have to go with Allahu Akbar. Totally random. You all saw it. It's amazing. The it. world of fun has correctly chosen the answer. And so the man screamed Allahu Akbar before stabbing two people. Now, David, here's an interesting addition. 
he also severed an organ from one of the victims. Now, this was not a strike at the neck. He severed a different organ. For $100, can you name the organ he severed? The organ? Yeah, a piece of his body. You mean what do you think he might have cut off? Was it his nose? Are, are, was it his ear? Oh, 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 oh! I'm, when you talk about organs, I was thinking of like internal organs. No, um, uh, 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 external finger, extremities. You know, fingers fingers is no actually finger. it. Yeah, he cut off the guy's hand. Why did he cut off the guy's hand? Um, yeah, the strike at their necks and like chop off their fingertips. That's it. Chapter eight, verse twelve. And Unless so, he was stealing and then hand. But it looks like he was just going for the the quick route. You know what I mean? Yes, exactly. You 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 hit the hand and you get the fingers. But the end of the story from Der Spiegel is that the police they are searching for the motive. Yes, really. They'll never find. They'll never find one. No. Not. Using their methodologies where what, there is precisely one explanation that is permanently ruled out of consideration, they will never find the correct answer. Exactly. Okay, uh, more stupid infidels. This is the story of a gentleman named Pagam Mustafa, who is a citizen of Great Britain. And he is a Muslim scholar. However... He has said, the, the story, unfortunately, I'm, I must apologize to Mr. Mustafa, I'm not familiar with his work, but the uh, Times of London says that he has been the subject of death threats from mosques in Scotland. Doesn't say what he taught to get the, fat, the death fatwas from mosques in Scotland, but he got them. And now he is claiming that the police are not taking seriously the death threats that he has received because they are afraid of being called... What do you think they're afraid of being called, David? Um, the the, the go-to would be Islamophobes, but I can That's think of a it, couple man. Others, but I go with Islamophobes. You win again. <clears throat> Meanwhile, I'm gonna need a, I'm gonna need a couple wheels. <laughs> yes, strike the neck, Allahu Akbar. Yeah. Islamophobia. That'll battle of about cover it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an update. I think we talked a few weeks ago about uh, Steve Flood, who was a counselor in Ipswich in the UK, and he was just expelled from the Conservative Party for the crime of Islamophobia. And why was he expelled from the Conservative Party for the crime of Islamophobia? Because Steve Flood, David, said that Islam was a faith that does not allow free speech. Uh, I mean, wouldn't every honest <laughs> Muslim leader on the planet agree with that? Indeed. I, uh, I don't know how anybody can, I mean, obviously the British authorities do not want to acknowledge that Islam does not allow for the freedom of speech. They want to give the impression that it's completely benign and wholly compatible with Western pluralism and secularism. But Steve Flood, actually, what he said in that regard was accurate. There are other reports where they say he was calling for the banning of Islam. That's another question. Uh, I, myself, am not in favor of the banning of religions and thought police and that kind of thing. Uh, but there's no doubt that there are deep incompatibilities between Sharia and western legal systems and those are going to have to be dealt with one way or the other someday they're not going to be able to be ignored forever yeah and um when i hear about things like this like someone saying hey as a matter of fact islam doesn't allow freedom of speech it has all sorts of blasphemy laws and things like that um and when someone states what is indisputably true and what any honest Muslim scholar or leader on the planet would say, if he weren't trying to deceive you. And then you punish the person for stating the obvious. It's like this overarching concern because this is happening in so many different areas where mm -hmm. anyone who has the courage to not mindlessly go with whatever stupid, idiotic, false 
claim is currently being spread. Um, and you, you, you punish the people who have courage to speak the truth. Mm -hmm. And if that happens long enough, then you got the, everyone learns, oh, OK, whatever else happens, don't say what's true because that gets you punished. So just keep quiet and hope that the problem goes away, at least to the next generation where our kids will have to deal with it. So then you get people saying two plus two is five, like in 1984, because that's what the state wants. Council of Europe has, uh, is, is going to vote, actually, on a resolution that accuses authorities in several European states of normalizing discrimination against Muslims. And it is calling on the various countries of Europe to address Islamophobia as a form of racism. Now, here we have the conflation of the definitions of Islamophobia. Islamophobia is never defined in these articles, never defined in these resolutions. And people think of it as meaning attacks on innocent Muslims, which are never justified and always to be condemned. It's also used, however, to refer to what we're talking about here, to, 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 to refer to honest discussion of what Islam teaches and how Muslims act on it. And so that was what is going to end up being silenced by the Council of Europe resolution and not just attacks on innocent Muslims. And, and think about how insane this is. They're saying, um, hey, you know, people are, are doing something that's calling for discrimination against Muslims. And if you ask what it is, it'd be like, oh, they're calling Muhammad a pedophile for having sex with a nine-year-old and things like that. Um, but notice if there, were, if there were any consistency in these leaders at all, they would have to say, hey, you know, Islam calls for discrimination against non-Muslims. Uh, in the Quran, Jews and Christians and polytheists are called the worst of creatures. Uh, the Quran calls for violently subjugating them. Uh, the Quran says that those who are with Muhammad are severe against disbelievers and merciful only towards themselves, only towards fellow Muslims. Uh, Muhammad said he's been commanded to fight people until they say there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. This is clearly, indisputably, 100% calling for discrimination against non-Muslims and therefore needs to be condemned. They wouldn't do that in a million years, not the leaders, of, not European leaders. They wouldn't do that in a million years. And yet, if you point out what I just said, then they want to come after you and say, ah, you see, you're causing discrimination. By doing what? By pointing out that Islam calls for discrimination. It's like, it's like, I mean, like, if you just pick like the stupidest people in the world and put them all together to be, to make decisions that are as dumb as possible, it's like, those are the people who became leaders of these organizations that, yep, it's, it's wild stuff. All right. Uh, I got a whole section here, David, that I call, what did you expect? These are the kinds of stories that might surprise people who believe what they tell us about Islam, but won't surprise anybody who knows anything about it. Uh, so, for example, our old pal Abu Bakr Bashir. You remember Abu Bakr Bashir, David? I remember the name, but there's so many Abu Bakrs, I, I like they're all jumbled in my head. Yeah, this guy, he's the one from Indonesia. Uh, he was a, a very prominent Muslim cleric in Indonesia, he uh, was linked to the Bali bombing in 2002, where 202 people were killed. He was uh, jailed for a while for that, but got out early. He's very popular, of course, 84 years old now. And he said that the Bali bombers had good intentions and purposes because they were trying to get rid of sinful deeds, such as music and alcohol, because they hit a nightclub. Uh that because music and alcohol go against Islamic law. Well, you, you could, I mean, following that reasoning, you could, you could defend anything, right? I mean, Osama bin Laden was just trying to get rid of evil. Well, yeah. ISIS, ISIS was just trying to get rid of, you know, hypocrisy and, and heresy and so on and establish a pure Islamic state. And, yeah, exactly. If you're a jihadi, you're a jihadi. You're going to see these things are fine. <laughs> So their heart was in the right place, Robert, when they slaughtered all those people. When they slaughter all those people in the name of Allah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> this is messed up. <laughs> oh, there's no doubt about that. So, Yair Lapid, the Prime Minister of Israel, 
he recently spoke at the UN and he offered to help create a Palestinian state. In response, there was a car ramming attack against Israelis that was publicly cheered by the Fatah movement, which is headed by the president of the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas. Another jihadi was caught trying to smuggle several dozen handguns into Israel. The next day, a Palestinian Muslim mob assaulted Israelis on the Temple Mount. The d couple days after that, they threw rocks and bombs at Israeli soldiers. The next day, fired shots at an Israeli motorist. You get the idea. Now, one would think that if the Palestinian leadership wanted peace and a state, that they might have put a lid on that, no? And uh, accepted Yair Lapid's offer. Why do you think they didn't do that, David? Well, I mean, they've been offered a state repeatedly. I mean, they were repeatedly, they've been repeatedly offered a two-state solution. Um, they, the leaders, the leaders don't want, I mean, even though, to be clear, there are tons of people in those territories who would love to have their own state, their leaders will never allow it because they want they want it all. They want mm -hmm. all of Israel and the people who are there in Gaza and the West Bank are pawns in their game to to a bigger game to destroy Israel. And they're not Indeed. going to allow it because no, notice if notice if if you ever actually got two state solution, I mean, m most people in Israel, if, if it weren't going to if, if we're actually going to be peaceful and say, hey, now we just have two separate states, let, let's not fight, would love that idea. Tons of people in Gaza and the West Bank would love that idea. Um, no, but notice, if you ever did that, then the leaders, they're out of power, right? Because yeah. now, pe now, people, are, now people, people are happy and getting along. We've got our states. Now it's hard to say, hey, we have to go and, and slaughter these, these Jews in the name of Allah. And so... Uh, no, I don't. I don't think the leaders are going to go go for it anytime soon, no matter what the offer is, because it's a, uh, it's 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 all it's all a, uh, all the people that they are supposedly leaders over are mere pawns in a in their quest to completely wipe Israel off the map. Exactly, and they want to completely wipe Israel off the map, very simply because the Quran says, "Drive them out from where they drove you out." Now, drive them out from where they drove you out is actually misapplied in this instance because, well, I showed in my book, The Palestinian Delusion, in 2019, that there were all kinds of Arab Muslim authorities in 1948, 49, 50, telling the Arabs to leave the state of Israel because they were going to destroy it and they didn't want them there in the line of fire. And they thought they were going to come right back after they destroyed Israel. It didn't work out that way. But they were not driven out. Nonetheless, that is the rhetoric, and on that basis, it becomes a religious imperative to drive the Israelis out. And they can't coexist peacefully. It's not Islamic. Yeah, it would. Be, it, would it would. I mean, according to Islam, it would be. It would be. Uh, you would be. You, you just. I mean, you you'd have to be agreeing not to follow what it, what Allah commands in order to say, okay, we're accepting this this solution. And so, bad situation. Indeed. Okay, moving over to Pakistan. Sad story. A woman got a job. A Hindu woman got a job at a new company in Karachi, and then went home crying because the Muslims in the company would not speak to her. And her dishes for the lunch break were kept separate. Why were her dishes kept separate, David? Because the Quran, that's what Allah says in the Quran? That is correct. For $100. I'm owing you a lot of money, man. Uh, put, it on my, put it on my tab. Yes, the Quran says the infidels, the polytheists, are unclean. Chapter 9, verse 28. And so if they're unclean, you can't have them eating off your dishes. Now can you? Interesting story out of Ghana in West Africa. A Muslim cleric, uh, let's see if his name is listed here. Yes, Sheikh Sidi Dukuri was arrested. And he was arrested because he was leading 12 of his followers in organized robberies and kidnappings. And I thought that was kind of an interesting thing. You know, you don't usually see that. 
uh, Muslim cleric doing that kind of thing. But why on earth do you think he would have gotten mixed up in that sort of activity? The second you said it, I said, wow, sounds like Muhammad. That's what I, that's what went through my head. That's exactly what Muhammad did. There you go. That's it. You know, people think, well, this is, this would be like the, the, the local priest or rabbi doing this. And in a certain sense, that's true. It would be like that, except there is no tradition in Judaism or Christianity of, uh, clerics behaving in such manners. Whereas in Islam, you do that, you're acting like the man himself. Yeah, Muhammad was a, he was literally a caravan robber. And Allah says in the Quran, Surah 33, verse 21, that Muhammad is the pattern of conduct for Muslims. Yep. So we, we should be more surprised when they don't follow the example. Indeed. So considering that this is the, uh, what did you expect section? This is a very obvious story here out of France. Uh, this is in the Brassens. I don't know how to say this because it's in French, you know, so there's all these letters that they don't use. I mean, that they've got there, but you don't say them. So anyway, there's a high school somewhere in every Courcour, Courcouron, in Esson. <laughs> and uh, anyway, in this high school, a teacher received a letter and the letter threatened to make him a Samuel Paty. Samuel Paty, of course, was the teacher who was murdered for showing a cartoon of Muhammad in a discussion on the freedom of speech to his class. Uh, this is a history teacher, a Jewish teacher, and the letter also said, we don't want Jews in high schools. Well, surely this guy would respect the people of the book more than that, wouldn't he, David? I don't, I don't understand this. Uh, no, he, so you have Surah 5, verse 51, of course, of the Quran, which um, says, do not take the Jews and Christians as friends. They are friends of each other. And if you do accept them as, as a friend, then um, then you, you're you one of them. So you're actually an unbeliever. Uh, but our, our Muslim friends are, are quick to point out that the... Um, that the term there en encompasses, you know, uh, protectors and mm -hmm. uh, a, a variety of various kinds of group. And what, what you're in addition to include your good in addition to including good friends, it's um, yeah, it's it's anyone who would who would also be in a position as a as a protector or some sort of uh, person in in authority. And so just following that just just mindlessly accepting okay let, let's go with that one i mean can you really have jews christians uh, let alone atheists polytheists or something like that uh, over your students and teaching them and the answer would be no and so here we are again uh <laughs> that's that some that somehow islamic law has to apply in everywhere including france indeed in uh germany Back to Germany, Turkish restaurant was burned down in an arson attack. And the uh, owner of the restaurant blamed the far right. Just like Uthman ibn Farouk, if I recall correctly, when he uh, poured ketchup on his shirt, didn't he blame you right away? Um, he was calling us out. It was funny because I hadn't even seen it. I had no idea that it occurred. And I start getting these messages. David, why haven't you condemned this attack? Is it because you approve of it? And then I'm like, what are they talking about? And then I finally click on the video of Sheikh Uthman. And why hasn't David Wood and, and the apostate prophet condemned this? Like, I don't know, because we haven't heard it. We did. We only heard about it from you right this second. And uh, yeah, so yeah, I mean, obviously, if, if, if we're to blame, then yeah, you can just blame anyone yeah so this guy blames the far right which of course plays very well to the german media but as it turned out he himself set the fire and so he has now been charged with insurance fraud shake him and fibbing indeed another story out of france another what do you expect story a uh, girl at Schurer Kestner Secondary School, which sounds German to me. Maybe it's in Alsace, Lorraine, where they, you know, they took it from the Germans because of uh, Hitler. Um, 
but I don't know where it is. In any case, uh, the teacher spoke, did not show the cartoons, but spoke about Muhammad cartoons and the freedom of expression to the class. And uh, this girl complained to her uncle who went to the school, confronted the teacher, mentioning once again Samuel Paty, and now the uncle is charged with death threats against a person with a public uh, ser who performs a public service, and the girl is charged with glorification of terrorism. You you imagine like you would think that we you know in Europe and America at least we would have gotten past this, but nope, nope. And uh, speaking of Islam and the freedom of speech, this poor fellow in Turkey, uh, he posted a photo of himself on Instagram on the 27th night of Ramadan, the night of power, the celebration of the moment that Muhammad received the first revelation of the Quran, encountering the angel Gabriel for the first time. This guy posts a picture of himself drinking Rocky, which is the Turkish alcoholic beverage, the, the Turkish version of Arak in Lebanon and Uzo in Greece and so on. And so he is now, because of this picture, been uh, fired from his job and sentenced to 22 days in jail. I, I, I have to say, I'm way more okay with 22 days in jail of that than like raping and killing girls over not wearing a hijab because last week we talked about like proportionality like indeed it, it would be what it would be one thing if they said hey here's the law and we're going to find you we're going to find you twenty dollars for not wearing your hijab or something like that i would say okay you know i disagree about that but you know okay you're finding the girl and stuff like that um but uh yeah now now what's rough is so this guy's going to be under the authorities, even for 22 days, it's, hey, this this guy who's, uh, you know, who insulted Islam like this. And so not probably, it's probably worse than just the 22 days is all I'm saying. Oh, yeah. Note also, David, this is in secular Turkey. And so it's an indication, once again, of something we've discussed before, how Sharia, even in states that do not officially obey Sharia, Sharia still has a powerful influence even over the legal system. Uh, back to Pakistan, a Muslim cleric named Muhammad Naeem Chata Qadri. He said that uh, it was necessary to kill pregnant women of the Ahmadiyya so that they are there would ultimately be no more Ahmadis. And if we are not able to kill pregnant Ahmadiyya women, then kill those children after they are born. Where could he have so gotten it this look, idea? It it looks like there. It looks like he's worried about the demographics, right? Just uh, hey, these eh, these Ahmadis are having lots of babies, so we better we better s stop that. So uh, crazy stuff. But you know, the demographics. I think it's not sufficiently appreciated how important that is. Mm -hmm. After all. Uh, Egypt was 99% Christian. Syria was 99% Christian when they were conquered. And now they're, they're, they're tiny minorities of Christians left. Most people converted under the stress of being dhimmis or they left the country. But, or and ultimately also they were outbred because, of mm -hmm. course, you have polygamists versus non-polygamists. And so this has and, an effect. It has consequences. Yeah, and this can actually happen very quickly because I mean, wasn't like w within a century ago, wasn't Lebanon a majority Christian nation? Oh yeah, oh and yeah. Then, and then, yeah, it, things get so bad that anyone who can leave leaves, and uh, Christians, uh, because I talked to I've talked to people from Christians from Lebanon. They said, mm -hmm. yeah, Christians were focused on um sending our kids to school and you know getting them careers and stuff like this and meanwhile uh the other guys were just having babies and babies and babies and mm. now now we're uh now we're outnumbered so yeah you can see why people what 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 what's always amazing to me with with the the with the Ahmadis is it's a they have a 
the difference is a different view of end times. Mm -hmm. um, it's because Muslims will say, ah, they're not real Muslims. They believe in someone who came. They believe in another guy who came after Muhammad. Mm -hmm. Well, all Muslims are supposed to believe in someone who comes after Muhammad. You're all supposed to believe in the second, in the return of Jesus. Ahmadis just believe that that already happened, that the second coming of Jesus already occurred. And so that's why they call him the promised Messiah, because he's promised in Islam that Jesus is going to return. They believe it's already happened. I agree that it's kooky and weird, but you know these are guys who believe in all five pillars. They believe in the six articles of faith. And so it's just, hey, you have this different view of the second coming of Jesus, and therefore we need, we need to exterminate your population. And it's just like, gosh, that like no one in Islam is safe when they're so quick to, you know, it's, it's easy with groups like the Ahmadis and so on, but I mean, there's all these different sects of Islam and they're all like accusing each other of being Kufar and, you know, heretics and so on. And it's like, you could, I mean, even if you took over the world in the name of Allah, all these groups are just going to kill each other. So it's like, there's no, there's no end to the violence ever. Indeed. That's great. Quite so. It's because there's a death penalty on heresy and on apostasy, and consequently uh, nobody is safe, really, because every group considers the other groups to be heretics and apostates. Okay, let's go to the actual jihad violence for this week. I think probably one of the most striking instances came out of Afghanistan, where Hamed Saburi, a gay man, was kidnapped and shot to death by the Taliban. And then the Taliban sent video footage of the murder to the victim's relatives and friends. Why do you think they did that? Uh, that's how you terrorize people. There you go. And striking terror is a Quranic command. In Luxembourg, we haven't had a whole lot of stories out of Luxembourg, David. 48-year-old... Uh, there, there's, no, there's, like, there's like eight people in the population, so you can't have too much going on in Luxembourg. Well, there's, there's seven now, because 48-year-old uh, man was accused of murdering and beheading a woman named Diana. And uh, it seems that he had helped... Her, he had, she had rather helped him gain citizenship, obtaining nationality for money, helping him arrange all that. But in response, he beheaded her. I don't know where he got the idea to do such a thing. You have any ideas where that might be, David? No clue why <laughs> anyone would want to strike at the neck of, you know, an unbeliever. Indeed. Always stories out of Nigeria, unfortunately, in one uh, unknown gunman, it says, attacked a church in Felele Lokoja, Kogi State. Now, it would seem to me that once they attack the church, we know who they are because there's really only one group in Nigeria that wants to victimize and brutalize the Christians. Uh, and so two people were killed, three others injured there. In another instance, in another place, in Injilang in, in village, in Chibok County, uh, this one took place at 2.30 a.m., Islamic State, West Africa province jihadis came to the area, set fire to six homes, and looted five shops belonging to Christians, and murdered three Christians in the process. You know, this also, this is, this it coincides with the demography, the demographic business you're talking about, that they want to drive the Christians out of the area and take over the area another 50, 100 years people are not even going to remember that there were Christians there. And it will be, this is this is Muslim land. This is part of the Ummah. It's, it's, and this is all, every bit of what is considered to be the heart of the Islamic world was at one point the subject of attacks of this kind. Uh, what, one quick comment, Robert. Um, Lithonosian Hussars said, uh, thoughts on Islam inventing algebra. 
I've wanted for years to make a video about that, but uh, yeah, on on the idea of Islam inventing algebra, just uh, tell that to the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Hindus, and the Chinese, all of whom used uh, algebra long before Islam was a thing. There are so many instances like that where something that was in common use before Islam is attributed to Islam. It's really astonishing. You know, actually, I saw uh, uh, somebody way back at the beginning here. Um, I don't know if I can find it now in all these comments, but somebody said we should revive the Byzantine Empire. And I thought, well, that's a very nice idea, really. I mean, I'm not a military man or a politician, but I am writing a book. I'm about half done right now, a little over half done, uh, about the Byzantine Empire. And... Of course, the Byzantine Empire was a Christian em entity, and it was explicitly, consciously Christian in all kinds of ways. And one of the things that it gave to the world was Hagia Sophia, which is still there in Istanbul, which was for a thousand years the grandest cathedral in the Christian world. And the funny thing about it, I, I came across a book a couple years ago of uh, somebody actually saying that it was an indication of how Islamic architecture influenced the Christian world, which is precisely backwards. It was the mosques that were patterned after Hagia Sophia. And so, uh, let me just ban the pornographer here. Mm -hmm. um, okay, that's done. And uh, But people are so thirsty to find achievements they can attribute to Islam because they want to justify the mass migration program into the West. And so they just capitalize on people's ignorance of history. That's actually one of the reasons why I'm writing the book. Yeah, and what, what's, <clears throat> what's wild is, I mean, if you wanted to say something accurate, you could say there were Muslim math mathematicians like Al-Jabr and so on who, who played a role and helped with the development. and so. But they can, they can never just say that. They can never say, hey, Islam had some philosophers too. Islam had some mathematicians too. It's we we invented this, and uh, yeah, again, it's it's all uh, it's the same thing. Dawah is always is always um, an effort to take advantage of people's ignorance. It's always, just, always, yes. it just always is. Uh, here's the real thing. You'll never hear this in Dawah. This is a story out of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And the Allied Democratic Forces, which is a jihad group, contrary to its name, which sounds like it's a political group, it's a jihad group, wants to establish Sharia in Central Africa. And uh, they stormed this kid Christian area, kidnapped, murdered 20 Christians, excuse me, kidnapped several others. One of the survivors of the attack said, I heard them. They were shouting in Arabic and Swahili, saying that the Kafirs should be killed, all of them, and make Congo an Islamic state. Shoot all of them, kill all of them, and burn their houses, these notorious Christians. And the Bishop of Beni in the Democratic Republic of the Congo says, We are losing believers almost every night, savagely slaughtered or shot dead, by the Muslim rebels. We do not get to know all the cases, but we can verify that since the beginning of this month, 50 have been killed and tens taken away as hostages to serve the rebels in their camps inside the forests. That's the reality behind all the smooth apologetics that we get about Islam in the West. We are not experiencing that in the West now. Just wait a while. Yeah, and this this goes back to what, what we just talked about that, that dawa is always an appeal to uh an attempt to take advantage of people's ignorance but islam adapts to whatever is going to be most effective for the ummah in that area so is would it be effective to just go around you know launching these mm -hmm. kinds of camps in the u.s and so on no what's what would be most effective here is ah oh, Islam promotes women's rights and Islam is great and Islam is a, a fount of scientific blah 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 blah. 
that's what would be most effective here. So that's what the message is. If you're in an area where they can just go around slaughtering you, then the message suddenly changes. And that shouldn't be surprising because that's exactly what happened during the life of Muhammad. When, when Muhammad is completely outnumbered, it's, hey, you know, God will eventually judge. Let's not fight. And then as soon as he's the most powerful force, everyone has to convert or die. And it's just, again, that's, that's the pattern of conduct, according to Allah. That's it, man. Okay, in the remaining minutes, we have a few stories about women. We always have a women's section. Uh, in Pakistan, a uh, Muslim kidnapped a 14-year-old Hindu girl, forced to, to, her to convert to Islam, and forced her to marry him. This kind of thing is so commonplace that the stories run together. It's, it's, it happens very often. Why does it happen so often, David? What is the thinking behind this? Um, yeah, so in Islam, if you, you capture a girl, she becomes, you know, the, the possession of your right hand and so on. So you capture her and uh, you make her, uh, you make her uh, marry her. You have some sort of forced conversion or, or whatever you have. And then you're the non-muslims the non-muslims have no right to object at that point because now she's uh she's the devout muslim just ask her husband who kidnapped her that's it and of course muslims can't marry a hindu a muslim man can't marry a hindu woman unless she converts mm -hmm. and so he has to make her do that in france this is story getting a lot of attention terrible story 12 year old girl named lola and she was abducted. There apparently were four Muslims from Algeria who were involved. She, was, she went missing, was found in an abandoned trunk with a serious wound. Where was the serious wound, David? Neck. That is correct. A serious wound to her neck. And... She was, of course, raped. And so this story has aroused a lot of anger all over France uh, because the Algerians who were involved, at least one of them was deported a few years ago, but never left. And there doesn't seem to be any kind of oversight in that regard uh, on the part of authorities to make sure that people actually leave if they're told to leave the country. And so there's a lot of discussion about uh, in immigration policy, about assimilation, about uh, not about the uh, teachings about the sexual use of infidel women in Islam, as there ought to be, but nobody wants to go near that. And um, even worse then, there was a, in Sciences Po, a university in Paris, they uh the some students got permission to put up posters of lola and then they were all torn down by unknown people uh people who probably don't want attention drawn to these questions and these issues so this is the future of france and of all of europe really because this these kinds of Behaviors are justified in the Islamic texts. Nobody wants to admit that or talk about it, but that is not that is not going to make it go away. Oh, and I did want to get this one in, David. Uh, this was in Austria. In Austria, I, I, let me tell you in the first place that uh, there were some people who got very angry with me last year or some months ago anyway. Uh, over a story in which a uh, Muslim migrant was, he killed his wife in the Netherlands and then he moved to Germany and killed his next wife. And I put it up at Jihad Watch and this guy got all angry with me and said, that uh, Islam doesn't teach you can kill your wife. Now, of course, that wasn't the point. I wasn't saying Islam teach, teaches you can kill your wife, but there were a couple of points I was making. In the first place, the craziness of the immigration that they he kills his wife in one country and they let him into another that's one thing but also that when you allow for wife beating it's hard to know when you're when to draw the line and accidents are going to happen people are going to get killed so i was reminded of that when i saw this story out of austria because this guy uh he is facing attempted murder charges 
for brutalizing his girlfriend, but he says, I didn't want to kill her. I just wanted to disfigure her. And he, of course, is a Muslim migrant from Syria. And I think, well, where did he even get the idea that it was okay to disfigure her? This is the reality behind all that nonsense they tell us about how you can only beat your wife with a toothbrush and so on. Um, and and notice, I mean, I've pointed out many, many times, it is very, very easy to justify killing a woman, giving, given the things that you can very easily put together mm. in the Muslim sources. So you have, again, Surah 4, verse 65, and other passages like it, which say that you have to, if you're a true believer, you submit to all of Muhammad's decisions and you have no resistance within yourself against any of Muhammad's decisions. So the, the moment you start, the moment you start questioning anything Muhammad says, or let alone diso actively disobeying the commands of Muhammad and Allah, you're exposing yourself as an unbeliever. And that, that's not, a, I mean, again, that's right according to the Quran, but it's clear that people like Abu Bakr, the first of the rightly guided caliphs, interpreted it that way as well. When he was when he was challenged by Umar about the apostate wars, where he wasn't just killing people who said we're no longer Muslims, it was people who were Muslims, they still believed in Islam, they still believed in Muhammad, but they were saying, we're not paying our zakat in the way that Abu Bakr says we're going to pay. We're, we're, gonna, we're gonna give our alms the way we want to. Abu Bakr said, if, if you don't do exactly what I say, I'm coming to kill you. And so there was there was not there was no room for even slight deviation from what you've been commanded. And so if you are not obeying Islam properly, then you're not a true believer. And if you if you're not a true believer, then, you know, you could be in the you're, you could be in the apostate category if you're if you ha had been a Muslim at one time or if you're an unbeliever, you could have jihad against the unbelievers anyway. And so, you know, if, if you have apostates, then you have Muhammad's command to kill apostates and so on. And then you have Muhammad in Sunan Ibn Majah saying, carry out Allah's penalties even against your own family members. And so notice if you have a, a wife, a daughter, whatever, who is just saying, you know what, I don't care about this religion. I don't care about this stuff. I don't care about this stuff. Then wait a minute. Okay, so you're not really a Muslim. According to the Quran, you're, you're not actually you know, a believer. So that would make you so if, if again, if you believed in Islam at one point, you'd be an apostate. If not, you're just, you know, someone who's non-Muslim. Um, and then wait a minute, you could carry out Allah's penalties even against your own family members. And so I, I don't I don't know, understand where where they're getting that this has nothing to do with Islam. It's very easy to justify killing your wife, your daughter, whatever, from from this perspective. So that's why you're not going to see an end of it anytime soon until we deal with the ideology. Indeed. And so that's why we're likely to be back in this space next week, ladies and gentlemen. So this has been This Week in Jihad. Thank you, David. And uh, look for us again, because probably people are still going to be acting upon these terrible misunderstandings of Islam that we have been discussing. Till then, that's the way it is. Wednesday, October 19th, 2022. Good night. God bless.